Hey there, guys. I see at least two people here, but uh, the question is... There we go. Knew I had markers somewhere. Oh, that's lagging pretty bad. Well, whatever.
Oh, how nice. We got the Russian porn bots already. Well, at this point, I will take it.
Hey, Dungeon Delver, how are you? Yeah, so I've got a pretty interesting setup. I've got my phone hooked up to a makeshift tripod, and then um, I've got my iPad on the side so I could actually type in the chat and see the chat because uh, I got no computer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happy birthday, man. Uh, so did you get your... Did you order your 3D printer? So uh, I guess I should be good for Gamma World on uh, Friday night then. Ah. So what do you think, by the way? This is uh, a battle map I am working on. It's going to be in my adventure. Um, that is tentatively titled Empire of the Undying Sun. So this is a little warehouse space. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I actually started this like two and a half, three years ago. Um, when I first thought, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to actually make a campaign. I thought, well, you know, first, of course, I'm going to write the whole thing, and then I'm going to have uh, some play test. And it just so happened that I was in a group, and what happened was the guy who was DMing, he's like, oh, God, I'm really tired of this. I need a break. And I was like, hey, I got something. So I started it, and I used it as like a bunch of blocks like three years ago and it was one of those things where i was always like okay i'm gonna finish it one of these days and then i never did <laughs> so now is actually my time to kind of get this ready as hopefully in a couple weeks i'll have a second test group to start playing Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a weird thing. I haven't done a whole lot of art in the last few years, so I'm pretty rusty overall. But it's one of those things where, you know, you kind of remember as you get going. So, you know, if I'm just doing squares and little circles, it's not that bad. <laughs> now, if you ask me to draw some characters, I mean, it might be pretty sketchy. Well, I did say if anybody shows up, I would tell some stories and, uh, so you guys want to hear about the time I was on Chinese ESPN? Oh, 
Yeah, no, actually it's good. Uh, the problem is not donations with the computer. The problem is parts. Uh, so I took it into the shop yesterday and they're like, yeah, uh, to get a screen replaced, it's going to cost, uh, you know, some hundreds of dollars, which was like crap. And the biggest thing they said is just due to, con due to supply constraints, it was going to be eight to 10 business days. So it's like, mother, oh, I had so much stuff to write to, but, um, yeah, so Chinese ESPN. So I lived in China for about four years from, uh, 06 to 2010. Uh, Dungeon Delver, I do not have an external monitor, number one. And number two, you can't see the setup, but like I have this drawing table right here and there's literally no room next to it um, to actually put anything. Hopefully in a few years when I move, I'm going to actually get a nice setup. Uh, I actually do have a 16 inch drawing tablet, but um, I can't change the resolution and it's way too small. What did I throw at the monitor to break it? Uh, I don't know. Apparently my glasses. We have little cubby holes under our bed and I was watching something before bed and I went to put my computer in there and my wife said I was like slamming it into my glasses. I don't know how that breaks the monitor, but apparently it does. Uh, oh yeah, so anyways. Um, so when I lived over there in China, uh, I did Kung Fu, right? And so you have a master and it's kind of a family thing and you help people out, they help you out. And so one day I'm over there, uh, you know, and we're training and stuff. And he's like, oh, Yan Zhao, um, have you ever played this game called, uh, I think the name was Judo Shir, which is like trying to describe it's hard. I wish I could get the camera uh, around to show you guys, but basically, um, you, so let's say you're standing up, right? You would raise your right knee and then with your left hand, you grab your right ankle so that now uh, it, your leg is bent at the knee and it's kind of like a point, almost like a spear tip or an arrowhead or whatnot. And then uh, I guess the object of the game is you jump around on your left leg and you have to try to knock other people over with your right leg because everybody's jumping around or you could give them like a butt bump. And uh, I was like, uh, no, I never heard of that game. Uh, I guess it's really popular for Chinese kids. So we had this mutual friend who was a professor at one of the sports universities. And he's like, hey, uh, this guy's got a master's student and for his master's research thesis, he's um, he's doing something on this game and they need to film some people playing it. Uh, you know, would you uh, help him out and go film it? And I was like, yeah, of course, no problem, right? So a couple weeks go by and he's like, hey, by the way, Yen Zhao, do you know any black people? Which, you know, as a white guy, I'm like, um... Uh, why do you ask? And so he was like, oh, you know, for the filming thing, it's better if you have more, more people. And like, that was kind of a red flag right there. Like, hmm, I think something's going to be up with that. Uh, but in China, that is pretty much a thing. Like they love showing uh, what at the time they called foreign friends, uh, which was just, you know, foreigners doing Chinese stuff because uh, they makes them feel all good about themselves. Uh, so anyways, uh, I did not know any black people in Beijing at the time, but they did find a guy from the Congo. And so the day comes and uh, my master's like, hey, um, what, another tab? I don't have any music going. Um, but at any rate, uh, my master's like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to the sports university first, uh, and they're going to give us lunch. 
And then we're going to go to, uh, there's a, a place called uh, the Temple of Heaven, which is a big, round, chinese looking building. You've probably seen it if you've seen, like, travel adverts, you know, to go to Beijing. So I was like, all right, cool, a little weird. And we get there, and it's one of these on-campus restaurants. And there's probably, like, 100 people in there. And I was like, uh, hey, what's going on with this? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're all going to go together. And so I was there, and a couple of the other people I did Kung Fu with were there. And when we get out uh, of this restaurant, I can see, like, there are three tour buses waiting, and we're all there. And um, I'm like, wait, are there this many people going? And my master's like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, well, why does he need this many people to film you know, just for a student thesis. He's like, oh, you know, that's normal in China. To which I was like, okay. So we get to the Temple of Heaven. And next to it, there's this building that has like, um, uh, kind of like a conference area or lecture area, performance area, that type of thing. And we get there and I see there are all these professional looking TV cameras right and so i'm looking at it and it's like beijing tv there's hebei tv hebei is like the province next to beijing and then i see cctv5 now cctv5 at the time was the national sports channel that went out to all of china and i was like hey uh you know master what's up with the uh, CCTV five, why are they here? And he was like, uh, oh, well, yeah, it's going to be on, you know, the national sports channel. Hey, uh, don't worry about it, though, because there's a hundred, there's like 1.2 billion people in China, but only 800 million have TVs. Uh, I was like, oh, OK. So apparently what this whole thing was is some people, I don't know who they were, uh, they were trying to start a league, right? It's like as if you were going to start your own football league or something. So it was somebody trying to start a league of people jumping around on one foot trying to knock each other over. So uh, I was there, and of the other guys that uh, studied with, there was a Canadian guy, an Irish guy, a British guy, and then there was uh, the guy from the Congo that they found. So what happened was uh, it was all of us versus, you know, one Chinese guy. And because, um, right, like it's the Chinese guy, the Chinese champ versus all of the other international champs, uh, which is hilarious because none of us had really heard it. And that was the first time I had actually seen it played is like they had some kid competition matches going on. So um, I lasted like all of 30 seconds <laughs> until I got knocked on my butt. Um, the guy from Canada, he was actually really good. He lasted the longest. But of course, as we were supposed to, um, the Chinese guy won. So that was, that was very funny. And the, the part that I thought was funniest is um, at the end, whatever promoter was putting this on was yelling at my master. He's like, oh, that white guy only lasted 30 seconds. And I was like, I've never even seen this game until today. But uh, I made 400 RMB off of it, which at the time I believe was like 50 bucks US. So I took everyone out for pizza, good pizza, not the normal schlock they have over there. Ah, well, thank you, 8 Mobius. Let's see, Lord Corrin, uh, I'm opening every crate if I am playing in this game. Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, actually, I don't know that you would have time to open them with what's going on in the scenario. But it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> well i mean you could do that all i'm saying is if you were in this room you would probably have other things on your mind than what was actually in these crates although i do have a list of some of the crates Some of it is just kind of useless stuff, like uh, there's an elven village not too far, and uh, right now elven fashion is big in other parts of the world, so like wooden elven masks, leather elven clothes, you know, nothing that's particularly interesting. I mean, unless you're into that kind of thing and you might get a new wardrobe out of it. But uh, yeah, there are some interesting things in here, which um, I mean, should you come back at a later time, if you're able, you might, uh, you might find some interesting loot. But uh, the game starts off in this town called South Bay. And as a name like South Bay would imply, it is on a bay. So they've actually got a lot of shipping business. Um, they are the, they're on the Western continent, but they are the closest to, um, the closest to the eastern continent and therefore they are now becoming a large-ish port because uh, there's a lot of piracy a lot of stuff going on where it is actually surprisingly easier to ship by land or safer i should say than to ship over the waters what's going to kill you in the room well well, that's an interesting question. There are actually many things that could kill you in this room, uh, depending on when you're in it. So there could be, you know, warehouse workers who don't like people coming in. Could be criminal organizations. Could be the town guard. I mean, there are any number of people and things that could end up murdering you pretty quick. Uh, no, no, they're selling fancy stuff. They're selling uh, burned Blu-ray discs, not DVDs. And also fake Louis Vuitton bags. No, no, Dungeon Delver, that's for later. That's a different room. Yeah, Fantasy OSHA, then uh, I might as well have, you know, Fantasy um, right next to my Fantasy Barista setup. Speaking of the Fantasy Barista setup, 
I've been thinking of that whole thing. You know, I really got to read the actual adventure, but um, you know, that might be in retrospect, kind of an interesting starting point for a game. Like, you know, Luke Skywalker starts as a lowly moisture farmer, right? So what if you start off as a barista in like a snooty college coffee bar where everyone treats you like dirt because they're all going to be like fantasy lawyers and land developers and you're just a lowly coffee swiller. And then from there you get the call to adventure. Now that could work. I would be, I would be down with that. <laughs> Come on, Dungeon Delver. If you had someone hanging out in a coffee shop and they're like, but dad, I want to go to wizard school. And the dad's like, no, son, we need you to grind more beans. We only need you for one more season to grind the beans. And then you end up going off on your own adventure, finding magical items. And then you're like, but dad, my friend Biggs went to magical college last year. And your dad's all like, don't worry, son. Magical college will still be there. And then a bunch of halflings in a wagon selling junk come by. And he just happened to buy the wrong coffee grinder. And a day or two later, when you're out trying to find out where the coffee grinder walked off to, a bunch of the town's guards murder your parents. Come on, Dungeon Delver. You can't tell me that doesn't sound like fun. Really, Doom Sword? No coffee shops? I'm a fan of the coffee shop. Um, so, first of all, coffee shops have been around for quite some time. I mean, they were around in uh, 1600s Europe. That's where the whole East India Company got started, where the idea of selling shares and stuff. <laughs> Yes, uh, I could see wars over bubble tea. Interesting, uh, interesting you bring that up. Uh, bubble tea is actually called boba, uh, which is a Taiwanese word, and one gold star to anyone who actually knows what that means. But uh, coffee shops are a good setup. You know, coffee shops are. <laughs> coffee shops are all right. Uh, I prefer taverns in general. However, coffee shops would be something like where a genteel kind of snooty class would be. Or like a pseudo middle class if you have that. It would also interestingly have an effect on your local uh, economy and health. So there are a lot of theories that tea and coffee are actually one of the things that helped spur European industrialism and development on. Part of the reason is, uh, you know, water was bad in a lot of places, but you have to boil the water in order to drink both tea and coffee 
So therefore, um, boiling it actually killed a lot of the bacteria that was in it. And people were, you know, they were therefore healthier. Yes, Lord Koran. Uh, well, not only does it mean boobs, it means big boobs. So if you were in Taiwan and you saw that, you can know where that comes from. Now, why little balls, they use that meaning for it? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, Dungeon Delbert, so that's really my question. If you have a high fan, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say high fantasy. If you have a high magic world, right, where there's lots of magical items floating around, wouldn't you expect a lot of that? Wouldn't you expect to see a lot of what we see in our world in um, in these fantasy places? But instead of using uh, science and technology, they would all just be using magical means, right? Like um, I was playing in a campaign as a wizard. And he was a pretty simple guy. He came from a humble background, right? And the thing that he wanted to do once he got lots of money is he developed a magical university that was cheap for regular people to go to. And then they built things like uh, freezers. And like they made, they made advanced metallurgy to give the common folk like a plow plus one. You know, like, wouldn't there be elevators and stuff, magical elevators, when they couldn't figure all this stuff out? I have had tea shops, but if you actually look through history, there's a lot of uh, different things that different cultures drink. Uh, so, for example, one of my places has uh, mate, which is what Brazilians call tea. And if you've ever had it, it tastes like smoking. Uh, for any of us who are old enough to remember what restaurants and coffee shops and bars smelled like before smoking bans started, um, that's what this drink tastes like. Uh, so why would you say that coffee is out? I mean... You know, in the real world, people pay extra money for beans that animals eat and then poop out, and then they make coffee out of that. Like, you know, since we have that in real life, like, how could, how could coffee be so bad? I mean, think of, like, pretentious stuff that super rich people do in our world you would have if you had like kings and uh you know high wizards and stuff they'd be doing all sorts of crazy stuff right like michael jackson was sleeping in a hyperbaric chamber and uh they have uh you know being in the la area i've heard of um women who get injected with uh blood from young people uh and there's like treatments where there's you know they use placenta to rub on their faces in order to preserve their looks and stuff so 
you know, you get to a certain point and it's like, is this really that strange? Ah, yeah, regional place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're in a small town, they're they're not not only are they not going to have this, they're not going to care. They're going to be like, this is just for, you know, rich people who don't have to worry about starving to death every winter. Ah, that's true. That's true. Well, see, and that's where you get into some interesting, uh, interesting ideas there, right? Because if you're a poor average slub, you, of course, are going to want what uh, these kings and other rich people have, right? So you're going to try to get it. And that means there's going to be a black market for those beans. And, uh, you know, some of these crates just might contain some beans. I actually uh, do have a coffee-like substance in my game. So in D&D uh, &D 5e, you have certain conditions. And uh, so you need to rest, basically. Uh, you need, unless you're an elf, you need to sleep for six out of an eight-hour rest period. Um, or you get one level of exhaustion. Uh, which means you start incurring penalties uh, starting at combat, you know, and eventually it'll lead to death. So I actually have coffee, which allows you to forego the combat penalty, um, you know, for one day. So let's say you got to stay up all night. You're going to forego that penalty the first day, but then you take two levels of exhaustion after. So you, you're basically, you sleep, and then the next day you're still super duper groggy. You know, that would be a fun adventure too. Uh, do you know how many times people tried to steal the silkworm from China? Uh, it was a lot until eventually some... Christian missionaries stole it uh, on behalf of the king of, um, of the uh, Byzantine Empire. And then the Byzantines had it, and they were like, ah, screw you, China. We don't need to trade anymore. And uh, that led to one economic collapse. I can't remember which dynasty it was in for China, but it was one of them. Oh, and actually... A very similar thing happened to tea. So in the, I think it was about the 1880s. Um, no, it must be the 1860s. So what happened was England was addicted to tea. And China was like, cool, we'll sell you tea if you give us silver. And England was like, oh, but we have all this nice wool and haggis and I don't know, whatever else they were trading. And China was like, nah, bro, we're good, just silver. Um, so what England did is they started selling opium. Now, I'm not quite sure where they were growing the opium, but uh, they were selling opium to China. So China was like, yo, bro, you're selling drugs in our country. Get GTFO. Uh, so that started the first opium war. Uh, which I believe is the one where Britain ended up getting Hong Kong out of the deal. 
Now, Britain, of course, kicked the crap out of China because China did not have a modern military. And there was kind of, you know, not a whole lot that uh, China could do. And uh, the Europeans eventually did it again. But so there, there was all this pressure, you know, how do we get in there? Because foreigners weren't allowed in China at the time, only in a few port cities. And so there was a Scottish guy who went to somewhere in southern China and he paid some Chinese people to sneak him through into the interior where they actually farm tea. And he bought a bunch of Chinese clothes and he had his Chinese guide and um, they had a, a, what's the name I'm thinking of? Palaquin chairs where it's basically you know, you sit on a chair and the chair is sort of like on stabs and there's a guy in the front and a guy in the back and they're like carting your butt around the country. So uh, that's what happened. He starts going around the country just dressed like a Chinese guy. And because, you know, people from one part of China had no idea what people from another part look like and uh, the languages that they spoke, even though we all think of it as standard today, it wasn't. You could not understand people from one different region to another. So as they were going through the country, um, the guide, uh, the Chinese guide, he just told the locals like, oh, yeah, he's totally Chinese. Um, he's just from the north, uh, which is also why he's so light skinned. Uh, and it was known that people from the north were lighter skinned. Uh, so, you know, the tea farmers were like, cool, whatever. You going to buy some stuff or what? And so that's uh, exactly what happened. He ended up buying some plants or some cuttings at any rate. And uh, he snuck back. Well, hey, everybody knows people from northern China have big red mustaches, right? Uh, so he ended up sneaking back to uh, the port cities, which might have been uh, Hong Kong or Foshan. And uh, they then took those plants over to India. And that's how Indians got their tea. Because uh, now the British were like, screw you, China. We have tea of our own. Although... They still wanted more resources from China. China was like super duper wealthy in terms of uh, materials, but also like gold and silver because all sorts of countries had been buying their stuff for hundreds of years. So they had it, you know, all sorts of stuff. In, excuse me. All sorts of, all sorts of stuff stocked up. I'm just going to finish this box and then it's time to cook dinner. You know, that's a good point, uh, Mobius. Actually, there are some Asians who do have red hair. Uh, well, there's a couple ways. One is they can be albinos. Um, and uh, due to albinism, uh, the hair isn't quite the right color. Um, so there are actually albino Chinese people. And um, there are some from Northern Asia who, especially when they're out in the sun a lot, the hair does appear reddish. There's also some Koreans um, who have the same kind of same kind of hairstyle. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dungeon Delver. Um, all right. I have got to head out. Got to help the missus make some dinner. 
Um, thanks a lot for hanging out. I just kind of wanted to try and see if I actually could stream like this. Apparently the answer is yes. Uh, so I may be doing this a little more often, especially in the next couple of weeks when I have, <laughs> when I have nothing to do. Um, when the computer gets back, I will probably continue doing this, but we'll have like music and a little more set, uh, idea of what's going on, but thanks a lot for coming. Um, if you want to see more maps and stuff, uh, let me know, leave a comment, click like, click subscribe, and uh, I will see everyone a little bit later.